This is the Waitley Elementary School Committee meeting calling to order at 801. Excellent. All right. Um, the first order of business, well, for the first order of business is an announcement. Um, uh, Kitty Edwards, our chair, and who has served on our committee for six or seven years, right about right, you two? Um, she's. Um, uh, she's I think five or five years. Okay, five years. So I inflated that slightly. Um, she has um, resigned from her position on the on the committee, um, and she has sent a note to the to the select board stating such. So the select board is going to be looking for a replacement. Um, you know, she apparently a lot of. You know, just for personal reasons of, of work and such is being a little bit too much on our plate right now. So um, you know, I just want to thank, you know, we'll probably have to properly Kate, thank Katie. We'll have to do our normal gift kind of thing and thank her for her service at a more appropriate time when we can have her here with us. Uh, but I do want to just thank her for years of service and years as chair as well um, for all the, you know, all the students in the community and just kind of keeping the ship going in the right direction. I just want to thank her for that. So. Um, so our first order of business, yeah. any other comments on that? <clears throat> All right. Um, so our first order of business was, was naturally happening tonight as well. So I think that's also maybe why um, Katie timed it that way, um, is we, we are reorganizing. Um, it, you know, we'll be reorganizing without the, the third person of our committee. So it's the um, most likely the two of you would be chair anyways. <laughs> um, one of the two of you would be chair anyways, you know, being um, veterans. Um, and then the chair can always reappoint positions of representatives later on if they wanna change that up. So we'll point the positions today. And then if uh, whoever the chair ends up being um, can do that, uh, can change those up as the year goes on. So my job right now is to open nominations for chair. Do I hear a nominee? I nominate Maureen Nichols as chair. I second. Okay. Any other <laughs> nominations? All in favor? <laughs> All right. Uh, closing nominations. All those in favor? Bob, roll call. We have call. to do a roll call. Aye. Roll call, Maureen. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, two, yes. oh, Maureen, you are chair. So, you are now going to take over the meeting and uh, seek, seek nominations for vice chair. <laughs> then maybe nominate Bob. <laughs> okay. Can I nominate as chair? Mm -hmm. um, okay, nominations for vice chair. I nominate Bob. All those Not in favor? favor? Oh. Okay. Do, Bob. Is this a, do we have to vote on it or just a nomination? You're going to vote it through. Appointment. You're going to okay. vote the three. You're going to vote the three officers through. Um, okay. Um, roll yes. call, Bob. Maureen, yes. yes. Okay. And so, Secretary um, Maureen, you were uh, last year as well as Vice Chair. So, um, I can, can stay. But I I can stay um, Secretary until we get a third person. Sure. So obviously, so go through the formal process of their Bob nominator. I nominate Maureen to be secretary. I second. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, I mean, you have to vote it. Sorry. <laughs> Bob Halley, yes. Okay, Bob's yes. Maureen, yes. Excellent. And then your next item is the Frontier representative. Um, I nominate Bob. If you're still willing to do that. Is that an appointment or is that a vote? Is that a vote or just an appointment on on the rest of the stuff? You're right. This is all appointment by the chair. You're correct, Bob. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, yes, I'll I be appoint Bob. Rep. Okay. Thank and you. the collaborative rep collaborative representative. I um I will still appoint myself. Can I do that? Yes. Uh, Okay. And the Capital Planning Committee representative. Uh, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. What do you think, Bob? If you, if you uh, want, fine. If not, if you want me to do it, I'm 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 happy with that too. I, I can, I can, can do always, it. Yeah, 
we can always change it once we have a new member and that person would maybe want to do it and stuff. We could change it at that time. Yeah, I, I'm just not sure what it entails, but I can I can do it. Okay. And the policy review committee, I appoint myself. And the sick bank committee, I think, has to have two people. So I appoint me and Bob. And, oh, okay, the union reps, I thought that was the negotiation one. So that should be all of us. Um, that was the at the beginning, right? Yeah. So yeah. Bob, Bob and myself and the negotiations team, I appoint Bob. Good. Okay. And the next order of business is to review and approve the minutes. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion for the uh, August 18th minutes. I second that. Roll call, Bob. Yes. Maureen, yes. And um, Shelly, we have the financial statement. <clears throat> so uh, since the last meeting, you all reviewed and signed 10 warrants electronically, uh, totaling $28,920.67. Thank you for doing that. If that process is not working for anyone, I'm happy to take feedback at any point. But on our end, things seem to be going well. So thank you for doing that. <clears throat> I did share the general fund and school choice reports ahead of time. Those are through August 31st. If you have questions about individual line items, I, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, there's not a whole lot to report right now as far as the financials. There's a couple of things that I'm keeping an eye on, such as the early childhood revolving account. We had talked about that at the last meeting in greater detail. There's no new changes to report. It's just something that we're monitoring month to month very closely. Uh, same with the school lunch program. Um, the USDA approved free lunches for all students and free breakfast for all students, which is excellent for our community. Um, it just means that the revenue stream will be different than what we're used to in, in the past. And there will be some government reimbursement. We're hoping that it is enough to at least cover food costs and overhead. Uh, but this is another account that we're going to have to watch closely moving forward. So month to month, I'll be giving you an update. There's nothing concerning at this point. It's just something that I'm watching. Um, the other thing to put on your radar is that, you know, Chrissy has been working out the staffing needs given the hybrid model. Um, this model has posed some challenges for us to make sure that needs of students in the building and students who are at home are met. Um, we have to make sure that we have adequate class coverage for online learning and for the building. Um, so we're assessing whether or not Chrissy will need to add some additional staffing there, possibly another IA or things like that. At the moment, she's done a good job of kind of reconfiguring what she has and who she has and making sure that we have all the coverage. But it's definitely something as we get students in the building and get more grounded this school year that we're keeping an eye on. Um, substitute coverage across the board for nursing, custodial, and teaching staff, IAs and teachers, is also on our radar. Um, our pool of substitutes is very low at the moment. Um, and obviously there's some concern about bringing outsiders into the building and, you know, increasing risk for COVID exposure. Um, so we might need to do some different things with substitutes this year and there might be additional expenses than, than we would have in a normal year because of increased absences. Um, again, nothing to be concerned about right now, but certainly something that we're keeping a close eye on. I'm happy to take questions if you have them, otherwise that's all I have today. Shelly, um, I'm just wondering, the the early, sorry, the early childhood revolving fund and the school lunch revolving fund, is there like a, a spreadsheet for those that, that we could see or would it just be one line? Um, I, the school lunch program is not in our database. That is tracked uh, separately from the school lunch department. Um, right now, there's not really anything to look at because there really haven't been a whole lot of expenses. Um, I can pull up last month's report and take a look at what the current fund balance is because I didn't include that on here. Um, but I'm pretty sure that there was some money remaining 
at the end of the school year. The early childhood account, uh, we do process that through the database, so I could include a report next month, although it doesn't show you this is the income and these are the expenses. It's really just going to show you the expense line. Um, but let me look at the balances of both of those accounts so that we at least know what kind of money we have going in. Okay. So the early childhood account ended the year with $73,000. So that means that that money from the end of the school year is available to pay expenses for this year, which is primarily salaries and wages. There's some other expenses, a little bit of supplies. Um, there's always some stipends in there to pay staff for professional development and things like that. Um, but it's typically salaries and wages. So between that and then the revenue that we anticipate coming in, this fund will be okay for this school year. Oh, sorry. Never fail. <laughs> um, what I'm projecting right now is a $21,000 balance at the end of the year in the early childhood fund. So, you know, not terrible. Um, some of our other schools in our district are in a much more challenging position with the early childhood program. Um, but that's something that we'll just be looking at month to month, especially if we have to go remote because we likely will not, excuse me for one second. <laughs> Sorry, I just want to close the door. Um, if we do go remote, we likely won't be able to charge our families, at least not the same rate as we're currently charging. Um, so like last year, we had a revenue loss, but we still continue to pay our staff because we were having students still attend virtually. Uh, so that's something that we'll have to take into consideration. Or if students withdraw from the program, that would be another thing we're looking at. So. Right now we're in an okay spot, but like I said, it'll be something I'm looking at every single month. Okay, so the year um, after it might, we might have to think about things. Yeah. Because um, we can't have the full amount of kids because of the limitations in um, having people in the same room. That's correct. Um, so next year will definitely be a challenge in this account, you know, and funding this program, typically it does fund itself and there is a surplus every year to carry over so that we have a cushion. Um, but we are likely going to have to put some of those salaries and wages that normally would be paid from revolving funds onto the general fund. So it's certainly problematic for at least the next fiscal year, if not a couple fiscal years out. Okay, so that that's what I was also going to ask you. I couldn't remember where we, where we were at. Are all the salaries on in the revolving fund, or any coming from the general fund? Some already come from the general fund. It's not a fully sufficient program, but okay. you know enough of them come from um, revolving that we would probably have to make some changes moving forward. Unless the program okay. can reconvene next year in the same capacity, which. You know, I, I can't imagine that that's going to happen so quickly, maybe in a couple of years, but I do think we're going to have to be um, conservative in how we we plan for revolving funds to be used to pay staff and might have to offload more onto general fund than we normally would. Okay. And the school lunch program, we're just going to have to keep an eye on month to month. Yeah, so the school lunch program also has a healthy balance right now. We're looking at $48,000 to start off this school year. So, you know, we'll certainly be able to cover our expenses and our salaries and wages. Um, it's likely that next year it won't be such a challenge for the school lunch program, but we do have to monitor it month to month, make sure that the revenue that we do have in coming in at least somewhat supports this year's expenditures, um, probably six to eight weeks. Once kids are in school, we'll have a better idea, which I know seems far away. It'll come quickly, but you know we're looking at maybe November having some more realistic projections there. Um, and I'll keep you updated as as we go along and as we see how many kids are going to actually be in school and what our reimbursement looks like. But again, healthy balance. You know, almost fifty thousand dollars in a revolving fund is a really good amount to start a school year off with. Um, okay, just depends how much we have to eat into that this year to cover expenses and what next year will look like. Okay, thank you. Right, I mean, You're welcome. The one other thing, you know, Shelly, maybe as Shelly said, it may be assumed, but you know, the government's, you know, providing the free meals is not reimbursing us for the full cost of what it takes us to make those meals. So 
we, without the income. So I'm just kind of making that clear that we're going to be eating away at our reserves there. And it's also for the public to hear. So they hear that the government's doing this, but they're not doing it dollar for dollar. So we have to pick up the expenses of the staffing. They may pick up the food, but, you know, staffing can cost almost as much as the food in some years. Um, depending on how many meals we sell out, we sell, sell or give out that kind of thing. Um, so it's going to be, it's a problem across all our districts because of our free, our free and loose reduced lunch numbers are not um, so large that, you know, we're going to have this massive check from the government. Um, but it's enough where obviously we have a need in our community, but um, I don't know, it's just another thing that's chopping away at our, it feels like free money, but it really isn't. We'd almost be, you know, Obviously, it's going to help those families in need, but the other side, economically, we would be better off without that going on. And then we just had a regular meals plan where we we're making money and having free reduced lunch for those students who needed it. So I'm just saying, I'm just kind of bringing that to attention because it's sometimes. Yes. Yep. Thank you. I have a question. Go ahead, Bob. Do, do, all the kids, do all the kids and the families know that there is free reduced, I mean, free breakfast and free lunch yes christy's shaking her head so yeah. okay yeah thanks that, um we've had several family meetings and um that piece of information came out in time for the last set of family meetings and we've gotten quite a few um emails and phone calls about it so i think it um, came out in an email as well thanks. to families yeah um I'm, I'm happy to see people taking advantage of that Okay, so moving on to unfinished business. The next item is an update on the school reopening. So Chrissy, this is where I kind of handed it to you. How about public comment? Oh, yeah, sorry, I skipped that. Um, public comment, they're to be submitted in writing and uh, the vice chair will read them if we have any. There was no public comment. Okay. So we'll All be right, talking so now. Move we'll be talking about the public comment when we get the policies about how we're going to address that. Okay. All right. So a reopening update. Um, some of the information that I'll probably share about reopening is also in my principal's report. So I don't know. You want me to just go ahead and read the principal's report? Sure. Yeah, I'll do the two together, Jersey. I don't want to go out of order. That's fine. You want to be bumped to the meeting? <laughs> Maureen will eject you. <laughs> That's true. You've got some power now that we don't have in a normal meeting. Um, all right. So I uh, am just, I just shared the document with my um, principal report on it. But uh, in a nutshell, we've had 10 days of professional development. The staff was engaged in professional development from August 26th to September 9th. They covered the following topics, health and wellness, remote learning, anti-racism, curriculum and assessment. They have many opportunities for team collaboration, which is a critical part of every year, but never more important than it will be this year. The staff at West has entered this new school year with a problem solving attitude. Our ability to support each other as a team will allow us to, make, to meet the challenge to the head. I'm really, really, truly grateful for their, their diligence and commitment. Um, there are lots of different ways that people are approaching our current crisis. And I'm, I'm so grateful that the folks here have chosen to um, approach it with a willingness to solve problems as they arise. Um, we have a new staff member, Molly Rice, comes to us um, to be our new kindergarten teacher. And she comes from a nature-based learning background, um, which is really gonna come in handy this year because they're gonna spend a lot of time outside uh, she's come to us at a most difficult time and has met the challenges of preparing for the coming school year as a new teacher with great initiative and enthusiasm. Really lucky to have her. I've already received um, messages from families who are very pleased with, with what we've been doing so far in the kindergarten. Our summer projects list was a little different this year, so we did the usual stripping and waxing floors, scrubbing walls, counters, furniture, and um, painting sort of the next things on our list. Um, we also spent time mapping out a way to bring people back into the building safely. Most classroom furniture has been removed from classrooms in order to create workspaces that maintain the six foot distance. 
Dan Talbot has gone through training to develop new protocols and procedures around sanitizing the building. He has also cleaned up areas of our campus that will be used for outdoor learning space. Um, so our totals for remote and hybrid, um, we'll have 25 students who will be learning through the full remote model and 81 students who will be participating in the hybrid model. In addition to that, there are 13 pre-K students coming in for um, two-day programs. And then to break it down by cohort, um, cohort A will be in person on Mondays and Thursdays. On those days, we'll have 52 students in the building. On cohort B days, which are Tuesdays and Fridays, there will be 46 students in the building. Um, Does that include kindergarten? Yes. Kindergarten and pre-K, those, those totals of cohorts I gave were for pre-K to grade six. But um, they're not part of the cohorts, right? They're there every day, if I understand not, correctly. The pre-K is not there every day. We had such a large number of um, pre-K students registered. I mean, even before all this happened, we had a waiting list. Um, and so at various points in the planning, we weren't going to have a program. We were going to have a program. It was, you know, difficult to, to find our way through that. But we felt it was really important to be able to offer something because um, we have a really great pre-K program here and, and would like to keep that going. So we broke the group in half and offered two-day programs to each of the families. Um, given that there were some families who could not accommodate a two-day program, and we completely understand that. Um, but we have... There are a few students who are coming in four days for various reasons. Um, so we have the, the highest day is Thursday with 10 students, and there are three staff members in there. And they've already- uh, But kindergarten will be there every day, right? Kindergarten- Or are they- No. Kindergarten is part of cohort A. Oh, okay. Do you have more specific questions or I don't know if you want? No, I was just wondering which grades uh, were Monday and Thursday and which are Tuesday, Friday. Um, Monday and Thursday is half of pre-K and then all of kindergarten, first, third, and fifth. And then Tuesdays and Fridays are half of pre-K and two, four, six. Okay, thank you. By picking by picking the cohorts, I see you got it spread out through the building, where they're not two that are like side by side. Is that was that a plan? That was part of, of the plan. Doing the other, it that way, Chrissy. The other part of the plan was to choose the combination of grades that yielded the the lowest number of families that were going to have kids in two cohorts. Um, it, it's not a lot to offer families, but we felt it was important to be able to offer families the same option to have two days that they can either go into work or work from home without the responsibility of um, helping their students through their remote learning day. Um, so we have invited the families who have students in both cohorts and it ended up being a very small number. It ended up being um, five families. We have offered them the option to send the older child in um, along with the younger child on that cohort with that cohort and they'll go to our remote learning room and it's going to be the same group of kids it'll stay the same it's not going to fluctuate um, it's it's pretty small there's a few other students who will be coming in more frequently than just the two days for various services so um, it is a small group and it it is it's sort of locked it's not going to be a changing group of, of kids are those numbers included with the 52 and the 46 or is that an addition that is an addition um, I'm still, some parents who we've offered the additional days to are still, still deciding whether or not they're going to take us up on that. So I can update that. Okay. I can update that before school actually begins. We have um, staff students, staff children in the building um, began this week. And we also began pre-K this week, but we brought kids in. Um, so we broke the group in half. And then for these four days this week, we brought in half of a half each day. So we had four or five kids, um, which was really, we thought it was, you know, kind of funny to bring four kids in with three staff members, but we absolutely 
could not have done it with bigger numbers. It was really important to see how things work, all the systems that are in place with a really small group of, of students. It's great. To Chrissy, do you have enough of supplies? Chrissy, do you have enough of supplies, um, yep, safety so supplies at your meetings yeah. right now? Yep. Um, as far as PPE, there is enough. Oh, you know what? I forgot something in my report. I have a new nurse. Andrea Gray is our new nurse. Um, and she's fantastic. And she has jumped right into taking care of that piece of things. Um, that's a very sort of involved piece of the job and, and certainly difficult to come into a new position and have be greeted with COVID, but um, she's really stepped up. And uh, the nurse leader, Meg Birch, has worked closely with her and we all met together last week to sort of talk through different scenarios um, of what we would do, you know, if a child presents with symptoms, what's, what's the whole flow of events. Um, if a family calls in and says that a child is sick, what do we do in those situations? So we've mapped things out pretty, pretty clearly. Thank you. I just, I just have to throw in, you can see the complexity of, it's like reopening a new school. And I just want to you know, tip my hat to Chrissy and her staff who just really have stepped up. Chrissy's put in, um, I don't even, I would say countless hours, but you really, we, I'm not sure I could count all the hours you put into trying to get all those different things from, you know, when cohorts are going to meet, what cohorts should meet, how are we going to do this, how are we going to handle the students who are at home and not part of the hybrid model. I mean, it's just been, it's been a very hard uphill battle and we're, um, we made the, through the first step, which is getting the remote thing off the ground. And um, I've, you know, Chrissy said she's received some reports from, from parents. I have as well regarding Waitley, just how well the teachers are doing and how impressed they are. Um, and so I just want to kind of throw that out there too, because, you know, getting the students back in the building is our next hurdle. Um, and, you know, obviously doing it safely and in a slow, in a slow manner, just as Chrissy kind of explained before, but I just wanted to just thank Chrissy and her staff because it has been um, Herculean tasks to, to get this, this school year up and running. So thank you, Chrissy. Thank you. Um, and obviously, it wasn't just me. I'm so grateful to have a team. You know, I'm I'm on the phone with the other elementary school principals fairly regularly because we're all trying to problem solve the same things. And it is like being a brand new principal on another planet where everything that you knew before is completely different. Um, and I've said this to the whole team here since they've been back that uh, the only way this all works is if we pull together and work as a team because things are going to come up. We've tried to anticipate every possible thing that's going to happen, but there's just no way to do that. And so as things crop up, um, having the positive attitude and um, sort of patience as we work our way through this is going to be critical. And people have been so great about that. Like I said, there are lots of different ways that you could approach this. And I've heard from people in other, in other school districts that the approach might be a little different coming from the staff. Um, so I understand and appreciate how lucky we are to have staff who are digging in so heartily um, and ready to take this on. It's not easy. It's <clears throat> the teachers are doing is similar to what we've all been doing in terms of creating a whole new thing that didn't exist before. It's a lot of work. The teachers are doing a lot of heavy lifting and putting in a lot of long hours. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to them for doing that. Um. Chrissy, I was wondering, what are the number of teachers that are going to be in person and remote or not at all? With, I don't know if that would fall under the FMLA if they're not coming in at all or if they're if, if they're going to be remote. Are, Darius, are there restrictions on what I share? You can just give the general how many teachers you have working remotely, just now what their qualifications are. You know what I mean? I have one teacher working remotely and two instructional assistants working remotely. Okay. And, um, oh God, what was I going to say? Well, I just want to share as a parent, the, um, that classroom page that looks like a classroom. I don't know what you call that. I really like that. I think that has been going a lot better than the, um, in the spring. That's so good. Have, so that's kind of, we got our fingers crossed that um, a big piece of what we we're hearing was, 
you know, confusion for the kids, confusion for the parents, difficulty navigating the day. Um, and we're really hoping that something as simple as that cute little virtual classroom is going to make things a lot simpler, um, easier for students to manage on their own. So those parents who are working from home have a little more freedom to be able to get their jobs done while their while their students um, work through throughout the day. Um, the tricky part is is really keeping a close eye on screen time because obviously we, we want to our kids to receive you know the best education we can give them and it's really hard to manage that while you're thinking about how much time has a child been sitting in front of this computer and how much time have my staff members been sitting in front of a computer um, so that's one of the things that as we get into it because routine is not going to be set for quite a while it's going to take a while to work our way through um, how long our meeting is going to be i had some concerns from a parent about first day meetings that were really long. And I think it made them think like, is this how long my, my child is gonna be on screen every day? But what happened was um, sort of the best laid plans. Teachers planned classroom meetings of a certain length, but it was the first day back and the kids were excited to see each other and they all had things that they wanted to talk about. So those meetings ended up going um, a little bit longer than anticipated, but it was really hard to cut kids off um, when they're excited like that. So we're, it's, it's going to take a while to get into the groove, but once we're in it, um, we really want to be so mindful of screen time. Um, how many activities are they doing on screen? How many are they doing um, off screen? And um, the, other, the other big piece is how are we providing support for kids throughout the day? Um, okay. And We'll probably be following up on how it's going um, from month to month, I imagine. I'm not sure how, do, Darius or Chrissy, do we have, um, how do we know if it's working? Like, do we have a way to assess that if, if, if our model is working? Well, I mean, it, depending on what you're, I guess what you're assessing. So are we, are, are students achieving? Um, you know, we're gonna be doing that through, obviously through a series of, um, you know, teachers are assessing the students and reporting back how things are working. Um, I, I think that's kind of, we don't have a, an independent assessment system for this model moving forward. I mean, so, you know, I mean, that's something we can look into. I know the state originally was talking about doing some early assessment of students to see where they were and what kind of what kind of drop we had from last March because we didn't have the MCAS in the spring and they wanted to do some sort of marker so then they could do another testing in this because um, MCAS I was on a meeting with the commissioner on Wednesday MCAS will be happening this spring um, he said um, there's probably very little chance of that being changed because the federal government it's a federal law um, he said the federal government is saying that they're going to want those assessments so they they we can track progress I don't think we should be afraid of those assessments we should see where you know what has happened in our community or educational communities and how we're doing in different areas <clears throat> and that can be one one marker not the marker of how things are going so we don't have a formal so to answer your question Maureen, but we don't have a formal uh assessment process of how this is going i mean we're going to hear you know obviously we're taking feedback from all the things that we do from parents from the teachers what administrators are seeing um we also will be rolling out um Evaluation. The, the state is coming up with how to evaluate teachers in 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 the in this teaching that's happening in those things. I'm, I've put that off. I met the association. I really put that on the back burner because we get it's one more stress on teachers that don't need to have you know out of the gate. Oh, and by the way, we're going to come in and make sure you're doing this right. Um, you know that is that is going to happen in the months as we move forward, but not out of the gate. So we'll be we'll be using that that data as well to see how things are going. A lot for me anyway, Maureen, is going to be um, observational, you know, that my, my benchmarks for whether or not we're successful is are we able to maintain those health and safety guidelines in a way um, that still creates an environment here um, that feels good to kids. We don't want to be scaring kids um, in our approach to how we how we maintain social distance and the hand washing and the mask wearing. Um, so if we can get to something that feels like a comfortable learning environment for all the students um, and the students who are fully remote um, feel included and are receiving all the support they need, to me, that will that will spell success. Okay, so if we could just um, maybe 
have an update each month just to let us know what's how it's going. Um, that would be good. Another question, I can't think of it. Anyway, I'll come back to it if I think of it. Um, I'm anxious to see how it goes when we move to the in-person, the hybrid. We'll definitely be talking about it, that's for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's heavy on my mind. Again, I'm really glad that, so starting the 24th, we'll, we'll be bringing those cohorts in. But as, you, as a parent now, on the 24th, half of cohort A will be here. So again, we're gonna, we're gonna ease our way into this, see how our systems are working with a smaller group of, of students. Um, at first, I was a little skeptical about doing the half of a half because we were pretty small numbers to begin with. But just after seeing um, how pre-K went and um, even with small numbers, and it went really well, but there was a lot to really think about um, that gets really real when you know that, that the kids are actually walking in any moment. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we're doing um, a quarter of the, the school at a time before we dive in and do a full cohort. And are they, are you still doing the library, the cafeteria and the gym? No, um, the, the way the numbers worked out in terms of um, students who are opting to work full remote it left us with class sizes that were able to be in the classroom. Okay. So the highest number of students in a classroom is um, 13. That's my biggest in-person class and 13 students um, fit in the classroom with six feet between all the desks and in a way that I didn't have someone, you know, seated in the, at the, the doorway. We, we tried every configuration of getting desks into rooms. Um, and there were ways to fit more desks in, but then it would limit movement and have a student sitting like right at the sink. And there, there were things that just weren't going to work about it. But the way things are at the moment, um, students are going to be in their regular classroom. Yeah. What class is that that has the 13? Um, Grade four. I was guessing that. Okay. All right. Let's move on then. If are you done with your report? Uh, definitely. Okay. Um, to anti-racism and equality committee's mission statement and goals. Yep. Um, and so I sent off the, the anti-racism equity committee's uh, mission statement and goals to you all. And um, Kelsey Kropp, who's joined us here, is not Zoom bombing. She is joining us to, uh, she is the chair or co-chair of our of our anti-racism committee. Um, has put, ton of, put in a ton of work this summer um, trying to organize um, our path forward to look at racism in our school and how to address it. And so she's going to talk a little bit about about the mission statement and the goals and kind of give us an update where we're at. So, um, and Kelsey, I'm sorry, is also a, is a guidance counselor at Frontier and um, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here this morning. Um, so the mission statement and goals document um, is something that we, we have a committee of about 53 um, students, faculty, parents, community members um, worked on this summer. Um, so the, the overall committee is divided into four subcommittees, um, professional development, curriculum, school culture, and um, school policy and procedure. So each of those four subcommittees came up with some goals for this year um, that they'll be working towards for the, the entire district, so each of the schools. Um, so some updates on where we are. Um, Amanda Mosea is a 2013 graduate of Frontier Regional who then went on um, to study history and social justice at Harvard. Um, so she was involved in the alumni letter that we received earlier this summer and she's been, um, she's been in a fabulous asset um, to this work. So she has been working very closely with the professional development and curriculum committees for the elementary schools. 
Um, so at this point, the elementary schools have had two of their professional development sessions. Um, so the first was an introduction to the concept of the anti-racism work that we're doing. Um, and then they had a choice of if they wanted to focus on either um, white privilege and identity or the history of racism in America. So moving forward, um, their professional developments will be on one of those two pathways. And each of the pathways involves various readings, um, podcasts, videos, articles um, that folks will be um, looking at in their own time and then coming together to discuss with some guidance from, from Amanda. Um, for the curriculum, they've put together some more specific goals for what they wanna see happen this year. Um, they're working on a list of developmentally appropriate vocabulary terms and definitions so that we can start talking at the elementary level of you know, what do some of these things mean and, and how can we start engaging with those um, in an appropriate way for our younger kiddos. Um, they want to provide five book recommendations per grade level that feature diverse protagonist plots and settings to make sure um, that we have representation of all of our students um, and also just all of the people that exist in our country um, so that we're making sure that our students are getting that broader lens from a very young age. Um, for their third goal, they're looking at using those two goals, so the vocabulary and having books in the classroom that provide that wider lens, um, to use those two goals as a foundation to sort of revamp the current curriculum um, to allow for more honest dialogue and learning around history. Um, so that might eventually include looking at how we teach things like, th like the Thanksgiving story, for example, of how can we do that in a more historically accurate way that is still appropriate and positive for our younger kiddos. Um, for the school culture committee, we actually, that's the, sub, the subcommittee that I serve on. So we have our, our one of our meetings this afternoon. Um, and what we're looking at for the elementary schools, we're really wanting to get some of our high school students into the elementary schools. Obviously this year that would be virtually, um, but we're, we're wanting to have some, um, some discussion circles between our high school students and some of our older elementary kids um, to talk about language and to talk about, you know, what are some of the things that you hear? What are some of the things that get said and how can we start addressing that? Um, because when, when they get to the high school, we do see issues with the N-word starting right off the bat in seventh grade. Um, so we know that the roots of that are even younger. Um, so we're looking at how can we start some positive some positive role modeling with our high school students have some positive um, some positive discussions with the with with our younger students who can kind of look up to our high school students um, and understand why why these words aren't okay um, and feel like it's coming from it's coming from you know the cool big kids as opposed to adults because we know they listen better to those. Um, and the other thing that we're looking at for all of the schools is looking at school norms. So um, some schools already have them, some schools don't. Um, so if you do already have them, it would be revisiting them and then inviting students to be part of that process. Um, because certainly at the elementary level, students are able to say, these things make me feel good, these things make me feel bad, and this is the kind of school that I wanna go to. Um, so we're looking at um, sending some some guidance out to um, the school leadership to say, all right, here's here's our recommendation for how to revisit these school norms um, and make sure that they really are a community effort um, and something that all of our students are involved in. Um, so that's sort of where we are. I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Um, I'm wondering, so I see that the co-chair, the co-chairs are you and Jameson Eisler, who's mm -hmm. a frontier parent. Is there any Union 38 parents on the committee? Yes. Okay, and there's, so how many subcommittees are there? There are four subcommittees. And so there, I know you said um, school culture was one, school policy, mm -hmm. right? And then is it professional development? And what's the fourth one? Curriculum. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. And there are representation, there's representation on all four of those committees from both Union 38 and FRS. Um, so the when we chose the co-chairs for each of those subcommittees, we had one person who is from FRS and one person who is from a Union 38. So we're trying to be very careful um, that the focus isn't mo- isn't solely on the high school and the middle school, that we are remembering and including our elementary schools. That's great. I know my kids had questions when they noticed that print, that Norman Rockwell print in Waitley Elementary. Um, I don't remember seeing anything about recruiting. How, how did you guys recruit these members, like the parent members? So there's a there's an organization um, in Deerfield, the Deerfield Inclusion Group, that's been active, I think, since 2016. Um, so we kind of put a call out through that network. Um, they have a Facebook page, which, which I think has, at this point, about 250 people on it. Um, so we had put a call out through that um, to say, hey, we're forming this committee. Um, it's open to parents. It's open to community members. If you're interested, please contact us. Um, and then there was a form that everyone was asked to fill out, um, sort of explaining their background and their their reason for being for interest for their interest in joining, um, and kind of self-assessing where they are on the spectrum of you know I'm a beginner at this all the way up to I'm an expert in this. Um, so that we had a good idea of who who was coming. And we do have a broad range of folks who are newer to this work and folks who have been doing this for a long time, which I think is really important to have that that broad range of perspective. Okay. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of that um, that group. So I don't I don't know if maybe next time we could send a, an email out to families to to see if there was any interest. Um, Of course, I might be the only one that's not on Facebook. Um, Well, the hope is that this committee will be a long-term committee um, and that, you know, some people, people will sort of come in and out as, as their commitments allow. Um, So we are open to to new members. We, we haven't turned anybody away at this point. Okay. That's great. Your work to go around if folks are are wanting to join. Yeah, Yeah, it sounds. It sounds great. The whole the whole initiative. You know how we built it was so that it was not built in one school alone, especially amongst the elementary schools, where it's on one person, and then when that person either burns out or you know you know has to do something else, it it would it would fade. And so the idea was to have a full community wide um, one to gain momentum. So as a school community, you're going to see you know we're going to be giving more and more updates um, as the year goes on about how we're doing. Um, It's kind of it's one of our accountability points, I would say, because it's our link to the public to find out, you know, to talk about what we're doing here. Um, I also, at the Frontier Committee, the committee asked if, we would, if I would look into if there was anything the committee could do about ed- being educated about um, racism and what can they do as leaders, educational leaders in the committee. So I'm looking into that. I'll be reporting back to options that we can do as a school committee. Um, the school committee also, you'll see policies coming your way that will be rewarded, not just for to hit the legal markers, but to hit the tone we want to change in our buildings. Um, a lot of our a lot of our policies say legally the correct thing, um, but does it say what you know what we what our beliefs are and what our values are within them? And so, um, the policy committee, which I'm on, um, is looking at those as well. Um, so. That's the work that you're going to see. So you're part of this movement as well, whether you, you've um, signed up for it or not, you're going to be part of it. And, um, and, that, and that's great. So you'll, you'll maybe see Kelsey more in the future or other members. Would, we're going to try to mix it up different faces. And I'm not, I'm not saying not just you're not going to just on Kelsey, but we're going to try to mix it up. We may even have students talking about stuff and that kind of thing, just to really kind of uh, show that it's really not just one or two people moving this thing forward, but it's a full it's a full group. So okay, great. I'm excited to hear more about it. Thanks, Kelsey. You're very welcome. Thank you, Kelsey. And you're welcome to click off. And I know you, you're you like the teachers are overwhelmed with all the things you've got to do as well. But thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Everybody have Thanks, a good Kelsey. day. Thanks, Kelsey. Okay. Update on HVAC repairs. So the good news is this was, I, you know, as you know, as I create these, um, uh, agendas for the, they're basically they're the same in all four committees for the most part. Um, I left it on here only because I it was, it was a big, it's a big talk 
in the educational world right now, how safe are buildings and such. So I left it on there. Whitley's in great shape. You did not have to have a follow-up, you know, while all the other buildings and the other four buildings in the districts had to have some either minor repairs, in some cases, some major repairs, and some major bills with those repairs. Whitley um, is, is passed with flying colors, the original, um, uh, we call it the original assessment of the school's HVAC system and such. So it's in really good shape. And so I just wanted to share that publicly. You got a good building and your HVAC system's in good shape. Um, I think the only thing that they're updating in that building is they're going to be changing to the MERV 13 filters. Um, and those have been ordered um, as well as some um, UV lights for the larger air handlers, not the single classroom handlers, but the larger air handlers. So that's what's happening to increase safety there. But um, it's a good report to have, so we can have good news at meetings too, not just things that are broken. <laughs> That's good. Okay, new yeah. business. Um, so we're going to be voting on the policies. So vote to waive first and second read and move to vote on revised policy BEDH public comment. See policy BGB. So morning if I could go through them the mm -hmm. the uh, so public comment obviously we had an incident at, at public comment um, or by the public on our meeting um, that was you know um, inappropriate and kind of disabled our meeting not kind of did disable our meeting um, so we we did I did what I call emergency procedure for this meeting say asking for things to be submitted 24 hours in advance in writing um, Donna checked it right up to the you know right before the beginning of this meeting um, so even are taking later we're even looking for later submissions. The other, you're the final meeting, you're my fifth meeting on this subject. So the other committees, what they've asked is that I look into expanding this even more. So right now, Google Google Meet, which we're meeting on now, um, is coming up with an update in October. It's possible that they will have the protections in place that will allow us to stop others from presenting without permission or talking without permission. Um, so this may be a short-term fix. Um, but the other committees asked me for the October meetings to, um, can I find a way to not, not uh, prohibit access from the community by creating something like a telephone line in um, where they can relieve a recorded message so they don't have to do it in writing if they have, you know, they don't have the, either the ability or the technology to do it in writing. Um, they also asked for me to look at any other options that could enhance that. So what they did is they voted the policy for that's written here um, and then asked me to go and try to put a procedure in for next meeting that's even more inviting for public comment if that makes sense so you have the policy to protect you as a school committee that you know and then I can put another procedure in um, that will try to open it up a little bit even a little bit further and then by then hopefully the Google Meet update will be there as well. We can see if that's going to be enough if we're going to have to have to do something long term. This language was recommended by our attorney. This language is being used by other districts around us. Are only are having just submitting in writing. Um, some have submitting in writing, and they also have a phone hotline where you can call and leave a message that will be played at the meeting. So this is not we're not doing something that's crazy that other districts aren't doing. It's a we're not the only district that's faced with the got hit with a Zoom bomb either. It's um, they're they're. Basically, they're going around looking for live sites. They're not looking for, from what I understand from talking with the, you know, the police and whatnot, is, you know, these people are most likely not even in the, in the area. They're just going around looking for meetings that they can jump into. And so they find things posted and they, they, they jump into them. They weren't targeting Frontier as, or our Union 38 because they wanted to mess up our district. They're just looking to have fun with any district that they can mess up in a kind of a vandalist kind of way. So, um Anyway, so um, the three, um, so I don't know if you guys want to talk about what you think about the public comment policy. It's a policy, as you remember, we were already talking about. We were changing to update to the MS MASC, and there was some discussion at one of our joint meetings that they wanted the attorney to go back and look at certain areas. I brought it back to the attorney, and then we had the COVID, um, the business of COVID and reopening schools. I put that on the back burner. So we will be talking about our public comment policy again in the future because um, it's not updated to the MASC's recommendations. And we were just kind of halfway through that um, 
you know, when, when COVID hit. And so we're just kind of adjusting our policy for this, um, you know, the event, you know, for the, the remote meetings, and then we'll be back talking about it again. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. So if there's no, you know, real comment there, the one thing we are doing is that in our policy adoption, um, it's, it's part of your packet, you know, the school committee may dispense of the sequence of a double read of reading prior, doing a one re meeting prior read and then reading again. You have to vote to move, you gotta vote to um, dispense with that process. And if you vote for all three of these at once, you don't have to do it, dispense the process three times in a row. Cause we're gonna talk about face coverings as well, which is the, our policy. I'll just go through and say them all, this is I'm on a roll here. The face covering policy is basically, you know, it's what our rules are for face masks in school. We need to have a policy that we're following. Um, so basically, you know, we, we created the rules following the, you know, DPH and DESE guidelines um, in the CDC guidelines about when face masks will be worn, what the exceptions will be, what the exceptions won't be, um, and so forth. It has also been voted on by the, um, I'm not sure if it's been finalized yet by the Board of Health, but I've asked the Boards of Health to also vote this policy so that it's a, you know, because it is a health policy as well. Um, and then we also have a remote learning policy that basically we've already put this in place, the all the structures of remote learning in place, but basically gives a format, making sure that we don't leave people out within our remote um, a remote learning model, making sure that um, when we built our remote learning model, which we did, um, you know, we brought in outside um, input in, in teachers, um, and parents, um, and faculty, and other community stakeholders. So it's just a basic overview um, of what we're already doing there. So it's kind of a, that one's from MASC as well. So I would recommend that you do a vote to, um, dispense with the readings, um, the policy, and then you do a vote to, you could probably vote all three together as one, um, one vote if you want. Well, there's only two of you voting, so I won't take that one. So move. <laughs> so move. I, I second that. So I just want to be clear, we're voting on the- Your first vote, your, your, well, your first vote should be to um, dispense with the policy adoption um, uh, uh, let, me, let me find the I think Donna even wrote it all out for us. So I'm, uh, we have the yeah, that policy has, yeah, yeah. it's highlighted. Yeah, well. okay, go ahead. So vote to weave the first and second reading. Um, and then so you first for our, for these policies, um, would be your first vote and then vote the policies. So moved on. Okay, so we're voting part. on my second roll call, Bob. Yes. Maureen, yes. Make a motion ex to uh, accept all three policies. I second that. Roll call, Bob. Yes. Maureen, yes. I got a question on the on the next one, Darius, on the MOA. Yep. Do we have to do executive session before we? Nope. No. Okay. So basically, okay. the next yeah. one is uh, uh, the MOA. We were in executive session discussing that as a full 38 um, associate uh, union, rather uh, committee, rather. Um, and so we were going to return to the meeting to vote that, and the meeting was disrupted. So now we are just doing it. Um, individually. So you have the ability to go to executive session, discuss this further if you need to go further on that. But I think we, we talked it all out in that executive session that evening. I, I, I make a motion to accept the, uh, the new MOAs. I second that. Roll call, Bob. Yes. Maureen, yes. Thank you. And I just want to thank the, uh, you know, the Teachers Association and um, for all their work in working with the school um, to come up with that MOA. It was a lot of meetings for, the, for those wondering. It didn't just come out of the blue. It was about 
I think it was about five or six meetings, about an hour, hour and a half each. Um, so you're talking about 12, 13 hours worth of meetings to kind of get um, where we were on that. So it was a lot of work and um, I think we both came to a spot where we were comfortable. So thank you to them, to the association as well. Okay, so next is reports. Um, I don't have any chair report. I'm not sure. Does anyone know what what that what kind of reports I would have? It basically just it allows you to give any comment that you want to if you have any any report you want to make. So normally there's not usually a chair report, but it gives you an opportunity if you want to talk about anything that um, you know is on your mind or creating of an agenda. You know if you want to you know talk about um, the next agenda you'd like to see this this or that. It gives you that opportunity. It's one of those things that's always been on there. That's something okay. we've done. So, okay, uh, well, I I just would like to have an update on how school's going um, at this point, every, every school. Absolutely, absolutely well. And so as chair, as you know, Maureen, what will happen is we, I create the, I'll create the, the outline of the agenda. Donna will send it to you to make sure if you wanna, if it looks good or if you wanna add anything. Um, if other committee members wanna add something, they usually, their the process is, our process is sometimes they just tell me, but the process they're supposed to tell the chair and then the chair can put it on the agenda. So if something else comes up between now and then or a concern that you want to be, that you want to be brought and discussed publicly, um, that kind of stuff, so. Okay. Um, I don't have a collaborative report. We haven't met yet this school year. So principal, uh, Chrissy, did you have anything to add to your report? No, that was uh, pretty much it. Okay. Darius? And I don't have a superintendent's report. Okay. So that's our meeting. Madam Chairman, I make a motion to adjourn. I second that. Roll call, Bob? Yes. Maureen, yes. Okay.